for conversation number six, Alan. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Great to be here. Great and we'll, to be here. Yeah, we've we've been having a lot of fun, and uh, so far um, been. the feedback from folk, folk is that us having fun has been obvious. So that's that's been a nice, <laughs> yeah. nice piece of feedback. Yeah, and it is it is it is nice to be receiving the feedback, and it has been. Um, it's been great feedback. But yeah. we thank those who have given us the feedback. Please feel free to continue to do that. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And and um, on anything that you'd like us to know, good or bad, um, as well as what questions you might have that you could throw back to us and be part of the conversation. Yes, indeed, and I'll, I will um, put a note to that effect underneath this um, this video and in the various places. Excellent. That we post that we posted. Yeah, yeah. So we thought, didn't we, Alan, as we were having our little prep chat for today, that we might take a closer look at each of the eight. You, you kindly, wonderful play on words. You referred to them as a sea change. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And we're we're gently suggesting to people that there's a shift away from shall we say leadership that um you know is more about where the lead is important and there's a lot of bullying going on in the workplace there's a lot of stress that's happening in the workplace i read a deloitte um, survey during the week that said seven out of ten executives are experiencing burnout yeah, um, Ian, and I, 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 I've been hearing about the, the, I hadn't heard the term burnout used for years. No, I mean, and no. over the last six months, it's starting to reappear. Definitely. And I've also been receiving and tracking a variety of information around the need for wellness as a focus. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I would say that employee well-being is yes. now the number one focus of all employers who are worth their salt. Yep. yep. And of course, we know that valuable conversations are a critical way of helping yep. people to feel good about themselves and, yes. and, and to be well. Yep. And I think that's a nice heading to, to talk about the the eight, although today we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk about two at a time, folks, because um, hey. uh, a, a deep dive um, is necessary. So today we're going to talk about candid and convivial. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the 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 underlying headline here is that this is about well being. Yeah, it's about yeah. helping people. Yeah, through conversation to feel valued, to feel appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yep. May I, I dare say to feel loved. <clears throat> yes. Yep. Because I think yep. probably, probably those, the three things, uh, appreciated is one thing, but valued is probably a little step up, step up and loves even, even there. Mm -hmm. I love the, the Greeks, um, Alan, um, everyone knows Eros, um, probably a few people know Agape, not so many people know Philia. Yeah, which the Greeks, the, the, the English translation is affectionate regard. Yes. Yep. And, and, and in my view, we need a lot more affectionate regard in oh, the workplace. We certainly do. We uh, certainly do. My colleague, Stephen Farber in the US, he wrote a wonderful book called Love is Just Damn Good Business. <laughs> <laughs> and it, now, it, can I do, can I be an Alan Parker bore again? Um, yeah. The minute you mention the word love or feel it or experience it, there's a neurotransmitter that occurs in your brain called oxytocin. Ah, another little drug that we produce o ourselves. Oxytocin is the most euphoric drug that exists in the human organism. There you go. Yeah. And in fact, <clears throat> it's it's the chemist, it's the chemical that's it's a neurotransmitter that's 
stimulated during birth, the birth process. Um, and it's, it is in fact oxytocin that allows the delivery to take place. Yeah, and because it creates a relaxation and a, and a euphoric state um, and it allows the birth to take place. It's also why fathers faint if they're at birth present at a, um, because it creates such a euphoric experience, their proprioception mechanism, which, and their vestibular system, which allows us to stand up and be balanced. It overrides that system and therefore they faint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But oxytocin is, it just is, it's the chemistry of love. Yeah. I think, I think you and I have both benefited from long-term personal relationships. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that you will agree that a key to sustaining love in a personal sense is a willingness and an ability to be candid. Yep. Uh, when I first started uh, doing this work 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, um, I had a reputation for being uh, a person who was good at helping people to uh, deal with conflict, I guess. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. I got I got branded a bit. In fact, this will this will um, take the folks uh, back, Alan. My first cassette recordings. <laughs> uh, there was such a what thing a, once when I was What's, a, what's uh, a cassette? That's <laughs> right. Um, the young folk probably never seen one. Yeah. But I did a recording. Uh, I did eight uh, uh, an eight cassette tape series that was called "Catch Conflict Before It Kills Performance." Oh, nice. How lovely. Um, and one of the things that I talked about was, was being candid. And, and I guess for a long time, I had a reputation for being candid. Some people called it blunt. Yep. Um, and it had, its, it had its uses. But I, I discovered over time that there was a need for conviviality as well. Yeah, yes. So I think that's why it's useful to yep. talk about these two together. Yep. Because I think they very much go together. Yep. And and they they support one another. Because there's a time to be candid, but there's also a time to be convivial. Yep. And being able to pick the moment is one of the skills of being a, a good conversationalist. Yes. Yeah. And I've got three bits of what you've been saying that I want to quickly pick up. Yeah. And um, one is you, your early conversation, your early convers comment about how significant conversation is for well-being. And yeah. and and I'd say well-being and healthy relationships. Yes, I'd, I'd agree. <clears throat> and the. The evidence in neuroscience is that regular exercise, diverse social interaction, and diverse stimulating conversation are the three primary factors of keeping the brain healthy and avoiding dementia. Once again, supported by <laughs> and and what it means Ian, the, the there's a big gap in that comment what it means is that the the calmer I am the less adrenaline cortisol and stress I have and adrenaline and stress you know they produce energy for us they allow us to do things we couldn't do hmm. but if we have too much adrenaline and cortisol and stress, <coughs> they actually form stringy um, tightening of the inner arteries of the brain and in the throughout the body. And also it reduces immune function. Right. Yeah. Right. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> 
So the more, and here's the bit that I think is powerful about what you've said, about the combination of convivial and candid. Yes. Is um, which one do I use first? Oh, well, that depends. Yeah. And that's my question to you. How do I decide when to do which first? <coughs> well, this is, this is a long conversation on its own. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I knew you'd have an answer, so I thought I'd ask the question. <laughs> well, I, I think there are, a couple of, there are a couple of things that are so vital here that are kind of a bit of a precursor in a way. Mm. And those, those two things, which I regard as the number one and number two skills of leadership, but I think they're, they're probably the number one and two skills of life in general, and they are self-awareness and awareness of others. Yeah. And if I'm really self-aware, and I'm aware of other people, then I'm able to read the room yeah. without ego. Nice. And so then, then I know which one to use because I've read the room. Yeah. And if it's a one-on-one -on -one situation, then I've, I've really, I've seen and heard and understood the person because I've got this awareness. Yeah. And so when I work with people in groups and, and as individuals, I really start with those two things because I don't think, well, I, I know that the, 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 when, there's, when people in the room have a high level of self-awareness and a high level of awareness of others, the conversation is immediately better than it would be oh, otherwise. Unquestionably. Yeah. So I think they're the they're the places to start. And, and I think, I mean, and Brené Brown has done a lot of work in this space. When we have those two things, we can be vulnerable. And vulnerability lived out loud also gives cues as to whether it's, it's candor or conviviality as a, as a kickoff. Yeah. <clears throat> what a lovely term, vulnerability lived out loud. Well, I don't... In, I, you, it, that single comment <clears throat> gives me a gives me a a key to something that I find to be too frequently missing, and it comes back to your converse, conversation about conflict and and get in early mm. and the earlier we get in the less chance it's got of inflaming and that comes back to this common term that people use about how do i how do i step into the conversation yeah and i can't believe how many people i hear say oh i've got a tough conversation coming and i always think it can only be tough if you put it off <laughs> Which is, which of course is, and that's where I, I shifted away in my early days because I, I, I got pigeonholed as a person to call in if there was conflict, disagreement, or difficulty. And I didn't really want to have that as a focus because I'm trying to, it was a great paradox because I'm trying to teach people on the one hand that if you have great conversations, you'll avoid yes. difficulty, disagreement, and conflict. Yes. Yes. Because um, I worked out, as you as you know, that there are, there are really, in in very simple terms, there are really only two reasons for human conflict. One is a disagreement about the goal or the direction or the objective, yeah. and the second thing is is a disagreement on how we're going to move towards that goal or the objective. I mean, yeah. In very simple terms, yeah, that's what yeah. causes conflict. And so if, you, if you're involved in a continuous conversation, in other words, it's like an old, conversations are like an old friend. Mm -hmm. When you mm -hmm. see him again, you pick up where you left off last time. Yeah. That's yeah. why continuous is one of the eight. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, and so I think the key here is is really, <clears throat> first of all, being being and continually working on being self-aware, then being aware of other people and continually working on that. And then those two things over time allow us to be vulnerable out loud. Mm. Mm. And it's that power, because if there's a container, as we call it, which we might delve into a bit, because I think one of the one of the challenges for people that host conversations and lead groups and so on is creating safety. Because mm -hmm. without safety, there's no progress. Yes. Yeah. People don't feel safe. There's no conversation. Yeah. Not not at a deeper level, anyway. <clears throat> yes. We. And and I think can candor and conviviality really help to create a safety. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, like, and, it, and it's like, knowing, it's knowing, like part of conviviality is a sense of fun and a sense yeah. of humor. Yeah. And yeah. as as you know well, humor can take the toxicity out of lots of things. Yep. And so often, often, if I was to have it, have a, a guess at this, I would say I'm more likely to be leading with conviviality than I am with candor. But, right. I, but as a group <clears throat> develops and as as the same group yes. meets and the conversation continues, probably you can be candid more often. Yeah. Because yeah. There's, a, there's a degree of safety and trust and yeah. so on. You're raising for me an urge to go. Because if I, for people listening and watching, um, most people look at me and think I'm an extrovert. When I was, I was the, I'm one of nine children, so 11 people in the house, and I was the only introvert. So I had to, that's why I'm still, that's why I'm still slim, man. I had to, <clears throat> I had to learn to be extrovert or starve to death. Yeah. But, for the introvert in me, um, I I often want to say, before we demonstrate the candor, can we agree that we're going to work with honesty? Yes. And and not assume that honesty is going to be there. Because the more I feel safe with you, the more I trust you, the more you provide me a space to converse into, the more likely I am to let honesty turn up naturally. Yeah. But if I'm not safe and I'm a bit guarded and I'm censoring what I'm going to say, yes. I, I'm, I'm actually by my hesitancy reducing the likelihood of the honesty that turns up as candor is that too is that making sense it is and it, it reminds me of the billy joel song honesty oh, is honesty. such a lonely word <laughs> but it's exactly what i need from you i think the words go yep yep um, but it i think honesty <clears throat> needs an opportunity <laughs> And so conviviality helps create that opportunity, doesn't it? I've got a really naughty thing going on in my head going. Is I it, want is it, no, I want it. <laughs> is it censorable or shareable? <laughs> no, it's shareable. I'm thinking, do I continue this conversation this way or do I spark Ian into a frenzy by saying to him, how honest is the corporate world you've played in? <laughs> well, it's not. <laughs> but it's better. Man, what, 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 because I share the same, mate. I think the corporate world has become so politically correct, so guarded, and so predictable that it, and, and so wedded to its marketing material. Yeah. They actually believe their marketing. I do. Yeah. Um, 
And I'm just wondering how how could how could we, the general we, how could we influence conversations to make them more real and more candid? In the business setting where repression and the demand to be culturally compliant is implicit. Well, one way is to refer to case studies of people who've done it well. Mm -hmm. Now, in the, in, in the case of Candor, Pixar comes to mind. Now, yep. now, nobody would deny that they're not a successful company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, now, Ed, Ed Catmull, C-A-T-M-U-L, if my memory serves correctly, he was the former president and CEO of Pixar. I think he's retired now from that role. Right. But I will put this in the information below the video. But he wrote right. a great book about the story of Pixar and how Candor... <clears throat> was so critical to their success in wow. the development of their films. Wow. So that's a, you know, I think an obvious place to start. Yep. That is a, a highly successful company. No one would say they're not, haven't been successful. Yes, yes. Who <clears throat> had a process for candor that was critical for them deciding whether a film would progress or not. Yeah. Yeah. They they had it down to a fine art. Yeah. In some ways quite brutal, but in other ways I found very insightful. Mm. So Ed wrote a book, and in the book, there's a great explanation of how it worked for them. And so it's like, you know, people say I, I you know, because the, the great dichotomy going on in the world at the moment in business is are we for profit or are we for purpose and the evidence is <laughs> the evidence is overwhelming absolutely overwhelming that for profit businesses make more money um standard and pause you know no one would deny i don't think that they are a credible organization They've done a lot of research in the purpose-built companies. And, you know, as I say, the evidence is overwhelming. Mm. So anyone that, uh, that wants to argue that, that for-profit is a, is a better way to go, mm. I don't know what they're talking about. Yep. And, any, and anyone that says candor doesn't work, well, that you can refer them to something like the Pixar story. Yes, yes. That's a big picture. Yeah place to start because the evidence is is available yeah i mean like you um i've spent a very large part of my life and still now the the biggest uh piece of time and energy that i that i do is in research yeah and and my research is into human being centeredness yes and so I'm reading books, I'm looking in all sorts of places, I'm going down a thousand Alice in Wonderland rabbit holes <laughs> to, to find proof and evidence that I already know exists because I've been doing this for a long time, but some, some folk need evidence. Mm -hmm. And the evidence is overwhelming that human being centered cultures do better than those that aren't. Yes. So I think that's the that's a place to start is help refer people to the research or the evidence, let them make up their own minds. Yeah. 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 But I, I think that the book from I Ed, Ed uh, is called Creativity Inc. I think it's the name of the book. Yeah. I'll look that up and thank you. Put that reference in. Now, I have an Alan Parker pedantic linguistic question. And um, the concept of are we focusing on profit or are we focusing on purpose, <clears throat> which I think has some correlation to 
candor and conviviality. Mm. What would it take for the conversation not to be profit or purpose, but how do we make it profit and purpose? What's your take on that? Yeah, funny you should say, because I was going to go down that road. Were you? Because profit and purpose is a dichotomy. It's a polarity. Yes. The, the, the most successful people are doing both. Yes. Yep. It's, it's one of these examples of a both end. Yeah. Yeah. And candor and conviviality are a bit like that. Um, yeah. Just candor on its own is a bit tricky. Yeah. Put it, put it with conviviality and you've got a powerful conversation. Yes. I'm not for one minute suggesting that profit's not a good idea. Yeah. I, I think if you don't make money in business, something's wrong with your business. Yeah. But yeah. It's, not the, it's not the reason for being in business. No. You know, profit is a result of being good at business, in my opinion. Yeah. Not, not a reason for being in business. Totally concur. But if you put the two together, um, because... If, if businesses don't make profits, they've got no money to reinvest in yeah. or research or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it should be both. Mm. And, and perhaps even, um, you know, there's, there's more than just the two. Oh. I watched, a, I watched a wonderful interview the other night with the Nobel Prize winning economist, Joseph Stiglitz. Yes. He was interviewed on the 7.30 program by the new host, uh, whose name, I apologise to her, is not just in my mind. but Former, former, six, former 60 Minute Lady. Yeah, I think so. And she was, she's just been in the US and she's done a lot of great Four Corners programs. Yes. Sarah Ferguson. Sarah Ferguson, that's right. Apologies, uh, Mrs. Ferguson or Miss Ferguson. Um, she said to him, what advice would you give the new treasurer in Australia? And his answer, I'm, and I'm paraphrasing, the purpose of the budget and the purpose of money is to increase the well-being of the people. Yes. I just about fell out of my chair. Yep. He's an economist, albeit a well-known one who's definitely leaning on the side of purpose. Mm. But I thought, what a wonderful insight that the purpose of a budget of a country and the meaning of money is to enhance the well-being of people. And so alongside perfect and profit, uh, purpose and profit, I would say, let's be about enhancing the well-being of people. Yep. Now, that might be part of purpose. Yep. Yep. I sometimes refer to it as a cause beyond profit. Yep. So you got the profit, but you got yep. a cause. Yep. But what wouldn't it be wonderful if every organization had a priority of enhancing the well-being of people, including other stakeholders, not just employees, but yep. customers and other stakeholders. Yeah. Now there are some businesses who are doing that. Yeah. And I'd love to see this. I want to see more of this. I want to see corporations, I want to see the end of corporations where shareholders own them. Yep. I want to see more cooperatives where employees and other stakeholders own the business. Yeah. And there's a bit of a trend in that direction. <clears throat> yeah. Because um, yeah. the reality is that a lot of corporations are not paying their fair share. Yeah. Yeah. We have that trouble here in Australia where we've got all these big corporations, including Google and Microsoft and others, who don't pay enough tax. Yep. You know, we've, we've got a, a newspaper media owner who used to be an Australian, he's now an American, who, who took his business away from Australia to register the company in Delaware so that he'd pay less tax. And then has the, I think temerity is the word, to criticise people in his media who don't pay enough tax. <laughs> mm. Everyone knows what I'm talking about, of course. Mm. So the hypocrisy 
of some of these people yeah. uh, takes the breath away. Mm. Yeah. The good news is there are more uh, ethical business people today than there was when I began my mm. work 33 years ago, I, I, I believe. Ian, as, as an individual in those worlds who is either aware of it or not, and I happen to be watching this, what would be your tip to the employees in the organisation around how could they influence that through their convivial and candid conversations? Wow, that's a that's a powerful thing in in several contexts. The biggest, probably the biggest context, is that a lot of people are afraid to be candid and and the convivial, not so much. Yes, a lot of people are afraid to be candid. Yeah, you know, we know that. I think this is rule of thumb research, but we know for certain that people leave their bosses not necessarily the business or the organisation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Or perhaps more accurately said, people leave their bosses more than they leave the company. Mm -hmm. And we know that one of the underlying reasons why they leave their bosses was because they felt unable to be honest and open and vulnerable mm -hmm. with their mm -hmm. bosses. Yeah. Or, and or they felt that their bosses weren't being honest and open with them. Yeah. Yeah, you know, classic example. Um, just a few days ago, talking to someone, somebody in this organisation decided that a whole group of people should be made redundant because the, the boss came out of his office. This is how we imagine the story went, and said to the accountant, "We've got to save, you know, some money." The accountant went away and decided to make a whole bunch of people redundant, and then. It went down the line and a whole lot of people were made redundant and, yeah. and none of the people on the ground were asked about this, including the people. Yes. And it just caused yes. total chaos. Yeah. And this is because this is what unethical, poor performing corporations do when times are tough mm. is they, f they get rid of a whole bunch of people in order to save money. Yeah. That, and history and a pile of evidence that would be five times larger than the the size of my house yeah. says that doing that's not a good idea. Yeah. 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 Um, but that's where it, that's where it kind of starts. And so people, um, it, it takes a lot of conversation. So I, what I recommend is people start with their own teams yeah. and start slowly, but surely to have the kind of conversations that you and I are talking about with their teams and with, and with a, with a group of people where there's, you know, where there's going to be some ownership yeah, and then let the good news of that spread throughout the organization. Yeah. And then, so let me, let me cocoon my, my group. Yeah. And create a positive subculture. Yeah. Yeah. And, and once I've got that, it will seep out but i suspect the next step is who are the two teams that we need to work together to produce the result we need to produce yeah and i can then creep up on it by expanding my team to the next one and actually having conversations that are interactive with other teams at a new level that's to me the best way to go about cultural change yeah if you try and take on a whole organization at once i think the evidence is pretty clear yep. most, of the, most of the time such an exercise will fail yep yeah you can't in my opinion and and there's a lot of evidence i think supports my opinion you can't force culture but if you but if you start with your team and as you say, you expand that to a couple of little groups that have got relationships with that team. A bit of a ripple effect occurs, and then what happens? And I've seen this. I've seen this over and over. Is someone from head office gets interested, 
Yep. And says, I know there's something good going on in those three teams. I better, I better go and find out what's going on. Yes. Yep. Then they do that and they find out that it's, it's great conversations. Yep. And then they learn how to do that themselves and they go back to their executive team as evangelists. Yep. In yep. The and then all of a sudden it can spread to an organization. The only danger with that is some of those people claim the idea is their own and that, yeah. Well, yeah. that's a, a terrible thing that yeah. happens. But when yeah. it, when it yeah. happens yeah. well, it's a good thing. You've, you've taken our convivial and candid conversation and you put it in that magic arena of culture change. So we're still in the seas. And, but you spark in my mind um, something that a, a great thing that happened with a client in Scotland uh, probably 12 or 14 years ago. And it was, it, it was, it's one of the large international banks. In fact, at the time, it was the fifth largest bank in the world. Right. And I worked with their Scottish branch <clears throat> and they had a very wonderful woman who was running the branch. And when I say branch, I mean the country. Yeah. And she was this wonderfully convivial, caring human being yeah. who was an incredibly astute financier. But when you met her, she was this compassionate human being. And she was put in the job because the, the culture was in need of some assistance. And she contacted me <clears throat> and we did an experiment with the entire country population where we got the group to decide if they were gonna have a new conversation, a new culture. What were the three or four skills that they all needed to do individually, irrespective of what anybody else was doing, what were the two or three skills, four skills that they could each individually do every interaction every day that would change the culture? Mm. And they actually came up with nine. And we built a piece of software and allowed them over three months to monitor and measure the behavior change. Would now, been, there was one particular branch, Ian, and they were they were a different bank. They'd just been acquired. The merge had been done very poorly and they were all very angry and disenfranchised and refused to participate. Right. But everybody else was going to participate. And the boss came to me and said, what do we do? And I said, let them not participate. And she said, yeah, but it'll, I'm going to let them not participate. Let's see if we can get everybody else doing the behaviors and monitoring them and they were giving each other feedback through the system. <clears throat> and um, I met with one of the people for, who didn't want to participate. And I said to them, um, is there any value for you guys to do this in some other way? And he said, no, we're not participating. And I said, how about you become our control group and you don't do the behaviors and you do your day-to-day -day work and see if there's any difference. And he said, yeah, that's fine. As long as we can make sure that we can resist it and we're not going to do it. And I said, that's exactly what I want you to do. Yeah. Mm. And so for three months, they didn't do the behaviors and they didn't score themselves on the system. But they did ask four people to review each of them. So the system was giving them feedback that they didn't change their behavior. Now, there are things in the brain called mirror neurons. And if there's enough people around you doing a behavior, it won't be long before you copy it. And at the end of three months, they were the second highest rating peak group, according to their observers' feedback on the delivery of the behaviors. I'm not. I'm smiling because I'm not surprised. <laughs> they they deliberately didn't do the behaviours, but because people around them were doing it, that ripple effect that you talked about is is in their mirror neurons in their brain. 
we have an, a mammalian brain that does nothing else but want to affiliate and make relationship. And the mirror neurons create that happening. So what their unconscious mind did was copy the behaviors and deliver the behaviors, even though they were consciously trying not to. And, and I think, you, I mean, you'll have a neuroscience explanation for, for why that happened. I, I think at a fundamental level and what I have been using for a long time, ever since I heard, you, you probably come across Michael Henderson. Yes. Calls himself a corporate anthropologist or he used yes. to. Yes. But he says culture is what does it mean to be human around here? Mm -hmm. And I reckon that's just on the Lovely money. Thing. Lovely the thing. Money. So, because typically culture is the way we do things around here. And I think that's definitely part of the equation. Yeah. But what a place to start. Yeah. And often when I've had resistance working with organizations, I've said, let me start with one team. Yep. And please give me the worst team. Uh, I do exactly the same pattern all the time. Because it's exactly the same thing. I do it regularly. Yeah. And let's and I often start with the conversation acknowledging Michael Henderson and say, let's have a conversation about what it means to be human around here. Hmm. And I've never ever not left the room of such a conversation hmm. with the majority of people yeah. feeling, feeling glad that they're involved in the conversation. Yep. Because this is what corporate a lot of corporations I I believe have lost sight hmm. of. Um, and you know, sadly, you know, this is it, this is still the case. American companies who I I spent most of my corporate career working for American companies, and they had a thing, and they still do today, and they call it headcount. Oh, is it a lovely term? <laughs> which makes me just cringe. <laughs> um, but they still do it, and and I often ask when I when I'm involved, I say. We we don't have head. We don't employ heads. Let come. Let me take take me please take me down your corridors yep. and show me where the heads are. Because I don't see any heads. What what I see is humans, and and this is the this is the challenge for organisations. We've lost sight of. I think it began in the industrial revolution. That was the great dehumanizer in history for in terms yep. of workplaces. Yep. And we're still suffering from the hangover of that, but we've forgotten that our employees and our cust our customers are unique, one of a kind human beings, each and every one of them. Mm -hmm. And when we forget that, we're doomed. Yep. Yep. So often a place to start is to go back to that place and say, what does it mean to be human around here? Mm -hmm. And then that will lead to. I've always found a surprisingly honest and open conversation when that's the topic. Yes. Because yeah. people say, well, we should be kinder. Yeah. We should care about one another more. We should be, yeah. uh, we should say hello in the mornings and goodbye at night and, you know, all sorts of things yeah. come out of that conversation. Yeah. Which, of course, are all fundamental human behaviors. And I'm just going to, before I forget, maybe, maybe we've got to add caring to our. Yay. <laughs> because I think it's different to civil. <laughs> I, I don't want to. I don't want to have too many C's. Just applauding. <laughs> but it's it's a key. It's the when I when I say let's have a conversation about what it means to be human around here. Caring comes out usually first. We've got to care about one another more. Mm -hmm. If it's not, we've got to care about one another more. It's we've got to be kinder to each other. They're yes. the first two things that come out. Yep. Nine times out of yep. ten. <clears throat> because uh, I sent a message to Jen two days ago. We're having some t-shirts produced. Right. And the neck, our neck, we we do t-shirts every now and again with slogan on the front and the back. And our last one was <clears throat> because of COVID and everybody having problems and having to solve problems and spending too much time talking about the problem. 
we came up with a t-shirt that said so what might we want to do with that now what might, might we what is exploratory might is speculative we as collective do with that now is present tense yeah wonderful on the back of the shirt it says <clears throat> keep moving progress is eternal <laughs> <laughs> our next our next t-shirt which i just sent the slogan off a couple of days ago is let's be kind with each other And if you see my back and I'm walking away from you, Ian, it says on the back, sorry, that's not okay. <laughs> yes, that's lovely. And it's, it's about, hey, let's be kind. And if not, let's be kind. Let's step into the conversation and say, sorry, that's not okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just... Um... I, I, I know this for sure. You know this as well. And I, I'm pretty sure that lots of people watching this will know as well that when we're kinder and more caring, performance improves. Oh. There isn't any doubt in my mind about that. Longer term. And I believe kindness and caring. Kindness and care produces momentum no doubt harshness and driving change requires motivation yeah i think we put far too much energy on getting motivated and yes, not enough on the idea that Yes, or the or the idea and concept that you know we can motivate other people. I've always been against <laughs> that one. You know what what we can do, I believe, is create environments where people motivate themselves. Uh huh. Because we know, again, the re the research is clear. Oh, it you know, does. Intrinsic motivators are what motivate us the most. Um, and the research has been compellingly saying that for my. Work life. Yep. Yep. Daniel Pink captured it nicely yes. in his book Drive. Yep. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Yep. Were his conclusions. Yep. And, and and the purpose thing is tied up in, and the autonomy thing's an interesting one as well because people want to be left alone to do the work. They don't want a manager looking over their shoulder all the time. Yep. Yep. You know, I, I've been involved <clears> in doing a number of exit interviews to help organizations to understand why people are leaving, even though we already know why they're leaving their bosses. Yeah. But when I've sat in exit interviews and or I've conducted the exit interview myself, I've heard words over and over like, if only he was kinder. Yep. If, if only he cared about me as a person more. Yeah. Yep. Uh, if, if he wasn't so aggressive, but was more, you know, and I've had people say, look, I've got no problem with people being assertive, but it's aggressive people that yeah. turn me off. Yep. Um, if only he wasn't such a bully. Yeah. You know, all these things. Um, and I'm emphasizing the word he, because you don't, here as much yep. when the boss is, is a female yep. Um, yep. you do if they're if the if the female's a pseudo man yep. um, but yeah so I, i've made a conclusion that women are better leaders than men yep. more often than not because yep. they're kinder yep. more caring as, as a generalization and I've written down a question again um, from your story. If only he had, if only he had. Yep. In exit interviews, I'm always staggered how deliciously candid they are. Yes. What would, and I, I wrote down, the candor is too late. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. What would it take? What would it take for us to reduce the number of people making those comments in their exit interview and having them? What could, if I'm that person, what could I do to have that conversation before? What, one of the solutions we've already touched on is begin with one team. Yep. Another is have exit conversations as a part of performance review. Yep. So imagine that you're leaving, what would be the reasons? <laughs> That, that's right. That's brought up a few interesting, interesting things. <laughs> um, Boy, um, I've got a group of people I'm working with at the moment, and they're just getting ready to start their performance review process, and they're all complaining about it, of course. Of course, because but I'm I'm actually going to make that suggestion to them. Yes, that and they have as exit interview segment in their performance review interviews. And, and the third one follows on from that because there are the majority of organizations are still doing performance management, right? Performance management, like <laughs> change management, is an oxymoron. Performance cannot be managed. So, and the other thing is that's in that's always almost part of the package is there are some organizations, even though the evidence is overwhelming. They're still doing performance appraisals, and the overwhelming evidence is they're bad for people's health. And one of the one of the reasons they're bad for people's health is that people hear things for the very first time in a performance review session. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, my advice to organisations is a quarterly or annual performance review is too late. Sure is. You need to have weekly check-ins where people are. Able, yep. So that there are no surprises. Yep. Um, and if you do it, if you have a weekly check-in, you you avert all this trouble later on. Um, you know, you know, I'm sitting here feeling like a good boy right at the minute. <laughs> you know, do you know what my next Zoom meeting is? A check, a weekly check-in. My weekly check-in with Jen. <laughs> there you go. So I, I will put a link to this because I've got a little e a little ebook. <clears throat> It's called the 15 conversations that count. Oh, actually. And, and one of those is the weekly check-in. Yeah. Because when people have, there, there are other, there are other of, of the 15, but when people have weekly check-ins, there's no need for a quarterly review. No, of course not. Or an annual one. Yeah. And I've never met a human being ever in my life who wanted to be appraised. <laughs> Me neither. Um, Me neither. Appraisals are what we do for houses and cars and other things, yep. not, not humans. Yep. Uh, as I say, the evidence is overwhelming that performance appraisals are bad for people's well-being. Yep. Couldn't uh, agree more. And, and, so, and if I may say, um, having spoken to a lot of people about them, um, who both administered them and experienced them, um, they are extraordinarily poorly executed and they are more appraisals and interviews than they are conversations. Absolutely right. Yep. And they're yep. one side, they're one sided. Yep. Yep. So there's a, I mean, I'm, we've opened a can of worms here, but. but oh. They're, they're really look, like, I don't know about you, Ian, but I, you know, I've got to be candid, mate. You do this regularly. That's right. Your bloody your candor just opens up cans of worms. Well, yeah. I make no apology. <laughs> but it does. And, and I think we probably should say that if you if you know if, if folks watching this need help with this, then reach out to us. Yeah. Uh, because we can we can, we can yeah. help. It might be a a good spot to close off today. May, may I say that I think uh, candor without conviviality is a slippery road. Yep. The two go together. Yep. They tend to emerge slowly one team at a time. Yep. And, and as the ripple happens, yep. there's a wider influence. 
Yep. And then that leads to what we're talking about here at the end. Yep. System change. Yep. Because our systems need to make it simple for people to bring their best to their work. Yep. Yep. I think I'd like to close off by explaining to you um, what happened when I first face-to-face -face interview with Jen, my executive assistant. Yeah. And um, I came into the meeting and we met in a hotel. So it was neutral, neutral ground. And um, I said to Jen, rather than, you know, do some normal interview process, um, could I invite you to either start the conversation where you'd like to start it, or if you've got any questions, would you like to ask me the questions first? And she smiled in her enthusiastic way and reached for her bag and said, oh, I'd love to do that, <laughs> and took out a book and she had 26 questions already written. <laughs> Wonderful. And I, I suspect my closing comment is to invite people to ask people to ask them questions as a way of making it safe for them to participate in a conversation as, because finding the words, the right words can be hard. Yes. Starting with questions. It's so much safer. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then that leads to where we began back in conversation one, that once once you've got those questions, which leads in itself to honesty and openness, mm -hmm. yeah. and you, you then can use the wonderful joiners and so and all those <laughs> other things where we began, which yeah. we'll, which I will put a link to as well. So wonderful again, Mr. Parker. Wonderful indeed and fun. Thank you. A joy. Uh, and if I may say, uh, immune system and health enhancing. I think that's, I think that's, a, that's just a wonderful uh, place to, uh, to end because, as we've said, it's got to be good for people's well-being. Yeah. And, and the Indeed. immune system, as I, I know, probably more than most, the immune system is so critical to our well-being. Sure. Is it anything that can enhance and enhance, it's got to be good. Yep. I'm with you. We'll see you next time, Alan. A joy, sir. Okay. Thank you. Bye. And thank you to the people with us. Enjoyed it a great deal. Bye-bye. All right.